She raised her hand and volunteered to go, to be with the children, to step into the dark and foul of the carriage, to have the light shuttered behind the small window barred, with iron on a journey where the destination was a rumor that had spread like the diseases within the camp, but not known for certain. The existence within the limbo of life and death in the camp to which she had arrived in February 1942, just a month after Heydrich, Eichmann, and the representatives of the ministries, including Dr. Stuckart of the Reich's Ministry of the Interior, had decided on the evacuation of the Jews to the east, it was strange at best. They all knew that the government that ruled over the territory wished them dead, but they had not been killed. Instead, they had been allowed a relative continuation of normality of life they once enjoyed outside of the confines, albeit whilst guards looked down with shouldered guns and horizons of barbed wire lined the paths in which they could move, and a total lack of medicine and food existed. Lectures were held almost every day, and on many days, two lectures were held. Subjects such as arts, medicine, economics, and Jewish history. Poets mingled with artists and worked together. In the evenings, there were concerts, performances, and even premieres of new musical operas. For such events, tickets were printed. However, as much as normality tried to continue, it was a normality that resembled a tiger in a cage. As much as the habitat of its wild is reproduced, it never will change the fact that it is still within a cage, and those on the outside control its fate. On some occasions, the streets were swept and cleaned by the prison masters. Street names were changed and the facades of schools and hospitals erected. The programs of events were encouraged, and then special guests would arrive and witness the little city, the little city of the Jews. Film cameras arrived, the lives of those within were directed by the minions of Joseph Goebbels. The cameras rolled, capturing a very similitude of a life that many, just about, remembered. Then, after the special guests and film cameras had left, the brutality of the new reality returned, and the constant threat of the hangman's noose fell over their heads once again. She was known, she was a writer, and musician, and often she could be heard reading to or singing to the children of the camp. Through the night, she tended for the children that had grown sick. Typhoid had raged within the walls of the camp and claimed many. Medicines could have helped if they, as Jews, were not banned from their use. She did what she could as she watched the children who wanted a life full ahead of them, who might have been destined to be the writers, scientists, artists of the future withered away before her, their potential unrealized, and for many, their names forgotten. There were also many who withered and died from starvation. Of the older generations within the camp, 92% would die. Many had names that were different to the ones they were born with. Others had never practiced the Jewish faith and were there because a legal ordinance or a law defined them as being Jewish. How many filled the squalid barracks infested with lies and disease were there because of the first ordinance of the Nuremberg Laws. Laws that stated who was a Jewish half-breed. How many men, women and children would have to perish in the horrors of the camps because of the scribblings of a pen in the Reich's Ministry of the Interior in Berlin. The ordinance that proof exists of that Eichmann used to send the Jews of Europe to the horrid fates. In the camp with her was Rosa Fitzner, who had once requested leniency from Nuremberg laws for her daughter, Gertrude, so that she may attend university, an application denied by Department One of the Reich's Ministry of the Interior, and Paul Weidt, who hoped he could escape the persecution of Nuremberg laws as he had helped the NSDAP members escape Austria when the party was banned in 1933, but was denied by Department One just two who survived to be able to tell the stories of the persecution they and their loved ones suffered because of the work of Dr. Globka. Whilst the dead were unable to tell how their lives were ruined and destroyed by him. 
The noose always hung, even when the shows were being performed for the visiting special guests. There still was always a fear of the roundup, of being forced into the train cattle carts to be driven to a fate that was officially unknown, but most were certain of. It was two years after her arrival, with her husband Villy and son Tommy, that Villy's name was called. For two and a half years since their arrival, they had survived the camp together. She would not allow the family to be broken now, so she volunteered. Volunteered to go with the children, with her husband and her own son, on the train that would transfer her from Camp Theresienstadt to Camp Auschwitz. But the train would be the last moments that they shared together. The journey had been harrowing, a distance not so far in peacetime, but an eternity in war. The train having to stand on the sidelines for many hours, as trains carrying the too old and too young to fight of Hitler's Reich, regardlessly trundled on in the last desperate throes of a dictator who cared not for humanity. An autumn chill filled the cattle car carriages. She, Ilse, did what she could to settle the worried minds of the children. She would sing or tell them stories as the weak and feeble by the desire of the Reich and its ministers fell around them, falling from life into the horror of the statistic of the Holocaust. The train, after many stops and starts, arrived at its destination of Auschwitz. Light shone on the carriage, long shadows fell from the bars that covered the square hall that counted as a window before the door was thrown open and those inside blinked at the blinding light that now momentarily washed away their vision. Once the initial blindness subsided, the light then silhouetted their surroundings. Figures watched behind the glass of watchtowers, capped men on the platform paced back and forth, dogs barked orders to unload, and the hounds at their heels growled and displayed their teeth. Ilsa helped the children down, Vili too, but within moments a guard was grabbing at Vili and pushing him aside. The Reich's men were on those trains to the east to have guns placed in their hands. Who was going to perform the jobs of the factory workers but the able-bodied Jewish men? Ilse and Tommy were held back with the other children of Theresienstadt. The youthful eyes that should have been innocent looked around upon the barbed wire and brick buildings that surrounded them. Corralled together, they were led away to a shared fate in the gas chambers of Auschwitz, a fate shared by many of the victims of the work of Hans Globke. Achtung, Achtung! Hier ist die Sendestelle Berlin, im Boxhaus, auf Welle 400 Meter. Meine Damen und Herren. Welcome to Achtung History. A weekly podcast produced by the Berlin Tour Guide and hosted by Simon J. James. This is Series 1, He Who Holds the Devil. Episode 8, Why Does the Portrait Still Hang? There will always remain a question mark over as to why Hans Globke was never truly held accountable for his crimes. Many theories could be presented, but none will ever be a justifiable reason for why he escaped punishment for the suffering that he caused to millions. The trial that brought together the people who had been punished under the ordinances and laws to which Hans Globke had created that was held in East Germany was, of course, dismissed by the West German state. The exposure by journalists and students of how ingrained the new West German government and judiciary was with former Nazis was dangerous. Any news that was related to the crimes of members of the government was labelled as communist propaganda, and in 1956, the fraction of the Communist Party that operated in West Germany was banned. Hans Globke also was quickly 
under the Adenauer regime at the head of the government, a government that was full of Nazis. Globke had at the farewell dinner of Adenauer's referent Hans Kleb spoken, you can rely on the old Nazis. They can be relied upon and they will always be reliable because they know what they want. Obviously, therefore, the West German state did not want to pursue him, for they would be pursuing one of their own. But why didn't the Allies, the British, the French, the Americans or the Soviets pursue him? Why, after a simple interrogation by the OSS, was Hans Globke allowed to walk free and continue his life whilst those who had fallen under his laws could not? We are concerned here with, a, with an act of humanity, with the maintaining of cultural values, and not least with a measure of considerable political importance. The effect upon all nations, and not least upon the Germans, of the fate of these innocent people, so mal maliciously persecuted, must not be underestimated. To leave these victims to their misery would be a heavy blow to all those who believe in human solidarity and would encourage those who believe only in force and oppression and who act accordingly. After receiving his American citizenship, Professor Einstein had this to say. When asked for the reason why I have given up my position in Germany, I made this statement. As long as, as I have any choice, I will only stay in a country where political liberty, toleration and equality of all citizens before the law is the rule. Political liberty implies liberty to express one's political opinion orally, and in writing, and a tolerant respect for any and every individual opinion. That is real American doctrine. But tell me, do you feel that America still fulfills the requirements you mention as a place in which to live? Yes, Mr. Dimock. Making allowance for human imperfections, I do feel that in America the most valuable thing in life is possible the development of the individual and his creative power. They may, there may be men who can live without political rights and without opportunity of free individual development. But I think that this is intolerable for most Americans. Here, for generations, men have never been under the humiliating necessity of unquestioning obedi obedience. Here, human dignity has been developed to such a point that it would be possible for people, impo impossible for people to endure life under a system in which the individual is only a slave of the state and has no voice in his government and no decision on his own way of life. I agree with you, Dr. Einstein. We simply will not be driven about like sheep. We are independent. We are self-reliant. We do not know what it means to be deferential to class or position. Fortunately for us, obey is a little heard word and cooperate is a common one. Stein appeared on TV. One can hear within the speech the heavily scripted nature. From Einstein's stark yes, there is no doubt that the words were words fed to him, 
However, the words spoken are very much opposite to what a large portion of the American people actually had. At the time of Einstein's arrival into the United States, the country was still very much in the midst of a racist segregation doctrine that in the southern states was embodied within the Jim Crow laws and the Supreme Court's ruling in 1896 in Plessy v. Ferguson of separate but equal. John Peter Grill and Robert Jenkins in the Journal of Southern History wrote in November 1992 that the treatment of blacks in the American South was in fact a mirror image of the treatment of the Jews of Germany under the Nazi regime. Blacks in the American South were often used as scapegoats, their livelihoods destroyed and stolen from them, accused of crimes they did not commit, murdered in the streets, caricatured in propaganda, and lynched. Lynchings were an event. Professional photographers were hired to witness them, as was with the case of Jesse Washington in Waco, Texas, where the process of the lynching by 10,000 residents was photographed by Fred Gildersleeve, or of Will James in Cairo, Illinois, where again thousands came out in attendance. Photographs of the lynchings were sold and turned into postcards, like with Willie Stanley in Temple, Texas, where one attendee sent a postcard of the charred body still hung in the air with the words, This is the barbecue we had last night. My picture is to the right with a cross over it. Your son, Joe. The same occurred with the once again charred body of Will Brown after the Omaha race riot of 1919, part of the Red Summer of 1919, an anti-black white supremacist series of riots, where a crowd posed to have their photo taken, none of the faces looking shocked, saddened, or horrified, but unreservedly proud and triumphant with their evil. All of these events taking place before the rise of Hitler and the Nazis to power. However, it was noted that so ingrained was the racism in America. When American troops arrived in Britain during the war, complaints were received by the colonial office of how Americans were treating black Britons. And it was not possible for colonial servicemen to enter any service hostel where Americans might be present. Whilst many historians have claimed that the horrors of the American system that existed in 1933 did not inspire the Nazis, legal historian Richard Bernstein, writing on the Jim Crow laws and Nazism, were, as far as I can tell, simply attempts to cite vaguely relevant precedents for homegrown statutes and policies to deflect criticism, not actual sources of intellectual influence. It is a fact that they did as they also took inspiration from America's eugenics program that was exported from California, the state that was performing more forced sterilizations of its citizens than all the other states combined, when it idealized its eugenics program and sent it to Germany in the form of booklets. Joseph Mengele, the so-called angel of death, and his crimes were a product of the Rockefeller Foundation's financing. For most to think that the horrors of what the Nazis committed across Europe, being inspired partly by the systems that already existed in the United States of America, is hard to fathom. An association comes therefore with the crimes of the Holocaust. But the Holocaust was the end result of Nazi Germany's program that was inspired by the American system, not a result of the American system itself. Often, the idea that it would be impossible for Hitler and Nazi Germany to take influence from America is perceived as impossible due to the conflicting political ideas of the two systems, fascism being fundamentally opposed to liberalism. It is more than likely that Dr. Hans Globke took inspiration from the American system, as James Whitman wrote in his dissertation, The United States and the Making of the Nazi Race Law, be it emphasized immediately that there was certainly never anything remotely like unmixed admiration for America among the Nazis, who aggressively rejected the liberal and democratic commitments of American's government. 
the Nazis were never interested in simply replicating the United States in Central Europe. Nevertheless, Nazi lawyers regarded America, not without reason, as the innovative world leader in the creation of race law. And while they saw much to deplore, they also saw much to emulate. It is even possible, indeed likely, that the Nuremberg Laws themselves reflect direct American influence. James Whitman also notes on the defense against associating the aligning of Nazi and American history in parallel, the scholars who dismiss the possibility of American influence on Nazi lawmaking have also used the wrong interpretive tools in making their case. Our literature has taken a crass interpretive track. It has assumed that we can speak of influence only where we find direct and unmodified, even verbatim, imitation. That is the assumption behind R.F. Myers, an Australian legal historian's, confident assertion that American race law could not have influenced the Nazis since American law did not specifically target Jews. We find the same assumption in Hanke. Nazi law was simply different. Hanke declared because the German laws of the early 1930s were but on step on the stair to the gas chamber. Unlike American segregation laws, which simply applied the principle of separate but equal, German laws were part of a program of extermination. Now part of the problem with this argument, which Hanke is by no means alone in offering, is that its historical premise is false. It is simply not the case that the drafters of the Nuremberg Laws were already aiming at the annihilation of the Jews in 1935. The concern of early Nazi policy was to drive the Jewish population into exile, or at the very least, to marginalize it within the borders of the Reich. Would bringing Dr. Hans Globke to trial create a difficult situation in which the victorious allies, the defenders of liberty, of the freedom of man, expose their own racist ideologies, their own abhorrent treatment of peoples who they deemed as lesser, either because they were not white Europeans or because it was convenient. For Hans Globke, immediately after the war, he returned to working in Aachen, which fell under the British zone of occupation. The British who proudly boasted of how much of the world was once coloured pink. Britain, as the colonizer of history, had sought to civilize the world, or so it told itself and its subjects. The Scottish-British historian James Mill, in his work The History of British India, first published in 1817, opens with, A duly qualified man can obtain more knowledge of India in one year in his closet in England than he could obtain during the course of the longest life by the use of his eyes and ears in India. James Mill sought to justify the need of colonization of India by degrading India's long and vibrant history into the notion that it was backwards and secondary. In 1943, Leopold Charles Maurice Stennett Emery, the Secretary of State for India and Burma between 1940 and 1945, spoke at a meeting of teachers. Empire brings out the idea of unity comprising infinite variety, but also that of responsibility for peace and good government, of trusteeship towards the weak and backward. The presumption, perhaps, because of the influential derogatory works of James Mill, that those of other nations must be backwards, because in their colonization by the British, could not be trusted to govern themselves, ignoring the entire pre-colonial history of India and seeing as Mills did, that an India before colonization was a collection of small states constantly at war with themselves, needing a foreign power to bring order and civilization. Also in 1943, the first Viscount Bledslow, conservative politician Charles Bathurst, president of the Empire Day movement, spoke at the Empire Day celebrations. Our empire so magnificently united in this period of grave emergency, was not founded on conquest and oppression 
like some empires of the past, which the Germans are seeking to copy, but upon bold adventure, love of liberty and justice, and spiritual ideas. Not found on conquest? Over 80 nations would choose to disagree. Britain was constantly at war to bring more nations under its controls. From wars with the French over Egypt in 1799, the Netherlands over Java in 1811, the entirety of Burma in 1885, amongst others. Not so much to bring liberty, but oppression and exploitation in an economic Lebensraum. During the Second World War, men of the empire who arrived in Britain felt the effects of the British colour bar that could ban people based on the colour of their skin from jobs, entrance to dance halls and bars, or even performing their duties as members of the Home Guard, as one member by the name of Roberts found when he made himself present for his picket duty at a dance hall, but was sent away, even after he returned in uniform. Women who arrived from the colonies, who wished to become nurses, were denied training in England because of the colour of their skin. The British Divisional Post Office stated in 1940 that they would not employ coloured persons, unless they were a very light colour, as revealed in a letter between H. Gosney of the Ministry of Labour and Keefe of the Colonial Office. It was not so dissimilar overseas in the British colonies, where white Britons were afforded better status, hotels and opportunities. In Kenya, non-whites were barred from attending the cinema. Britain was purposefully keeping its colonial subjects in a state of constant denial from opportunities at home and abroad. On the Gold Coast, a barrister, Dr. J. B. Dankwa, wrote, Is it really true that it is a policy of the colonial office today that no matter how well an African may be qualified for taking a share in the government of his own country, he will not be given that opportunity to participate, for the simple reason that he is a native? If so... Where are the Africans to get experience for the promised self-government? If so, why make declarations of trusteeship? It was the gift of an attainable promise to the minds and mentality of the people of the empire to attain greater independence, but on paper and in reality, it was something that the British used to quell the potential revolutionary minds with no true intention of granting self-determination. In India, the British control during the war was a disaster, especially in Bengal, the region of India that borders Burma, where a scorched earth policy was enacted after the success of the Japanese invasion of Burma. Coupled with natural disasters and Winston Churchill's exceptionally racist views of the Indian people would result in the deaths of between 2.1 and 3 million people through famine and the resulting starvation and disease. When speaking to Amory, Churchill had stated that he hated Indians who bred like rabbits. Churchill refused Canadian proposals to send aid to Bengal, as it was in the darkest depths of the famine. Amory became exasperated by Churchill and his cabinet's abject refusal to allow any help, or even for the region to use its own cash reserves and ships to import food. Avery, in his diary, would note, On the subject of India, Winston is not quite sane. I do not see much difference between Churchill's outlook and Hitler's. Sadly, this story of famine was not the first in India to be caused as a result of the British and the British East India Company's policies that exploited the native population and their lands. Cornelius Walford calculated in 1877 that in the 120 years of British rule, there were 34 recorded famines in India, compared to just 17 in the prior two millennia. Before the British, the Mughals used tax revenues to finance water conservation and banned exports if a famine looked as if it were to hit. The British did away with the system, exploited a nation and let millions upon millions die. And this was just one area, albeit a very large area, that was under the British flag. 
The arrival of black American GIs to Britain during the war also created a problem in the minds of the British governmental establishment, as Sonia O. Rose writes in her dissertation, Race, Empire, and British Wartime National Identity. Officials were concerned that ordinary British citizens were insufficiently race-conscious, and that they would, as a result, be overly friendly to black Americans. This conundrum led to a confusing assortment of British responses to the presence of black Americans, including educating British women and girls about the perils of interracial romance. Not so dissimilar from Dr. Globka's work in the Czech lands of Bohemia and Moravia, when through his laws Dr. Globka discouraged the marriage of a German to a Czech, whom he considered and therefore created a law to ensure became a second-class citizen of unworthy racial heritage. Rose goes on to state, Fundamentally, the British government wanted the US military to take the colour problem back to the states with them after the war. For France, the other member of the Western Allies, the story was not so much different in terms of brutal control and suppression of the natives of nations under the French flag and the code of the indigenous that created an inferior status for natives of the French colonies from 1887 until 1947. For Algeria, the first code of the indigenous was not so dissimilar from Dr. Globke's work on the status of the Volksdeutsch in the Sudetenland. It read, The Muslim indigenous is French. However, he will continue to be the subject to Muslim law. He may be admitted to serve in the terrestrial and marine army, he may be called to functions in civil employment in Algeria. He may, on his demand, be admitted to enjoy the rights of a French citizen. In this case, he is subjected to the political and civil laws of France. This was first introduced in 1865, but in 1881, the code was formalized, and if a Muslim has chosen, as nearly all did, not to be a French citizen, their lands could be subject to seizure or appropriation. As the French Empire expanded and came to rule over Guyana, New Caledonia, and Madagascar, the code was used to control the native populace, but to deny the native people the rights of Frenchmen. Rights were given to the commandant of the circular, the smallest unit of French political administration, to be the judges of the indigenous. But really this meant any Caucasian person had the rights to deliver punishments for any of 34 infractions, with punishments ranging from imprisonment to death. Often the punishments were periods of forced labour, known as corvée, with much of the operations of Senegal all the way through into the 1940s being operated by forced labour. In 1930, the Geneva Convention outlawed the French system of corvée. France introduced a higher tax on the people of West Africa in reaction a tax that could be paid off via forced labour. Jean Souré Canillet notes in French colonialism in tropical Africa that in 1935 in French Cameroon, 32,858 people were imprisoned for infractions of the indigent compared to 3,512 for common law offences. So it is quite possible that Dr. Hans Globke was not brought to stand trial because he embodied through his laws that subjugated, deprived, degenerated native populations of conquered territories too much of what the Western Allied nations were doing themselves. And placing a man like Globke on trial may be tantamount to placing a mirror on the stand. It also might be due to his study of law, he was surely aware of some of the laws that had been created by Britain, France, and especially, as we have seen, America, and with his sharp legal mind, he might have been a formidable foe if brought to stand trial. An alternative may be that with Germany in ruins after the war, and the faces of the Third Reich, Goering, Speer, Frick, Ribbentrop, Having been placed on trial and either executed or imprisoned, a strong yet unknown face might be needed to help in the rebuilding of Germany. And Dr. Globke 
could present a strong candidate for this role, aided in his never being a member of the Nazi party, although he did apply but was rejected by Martin Bormann due to his being a member of the Centrum party. He could present a useful role to the Allies in the new nation that was being formed under the face of Konrad Adenauer. Globke, as he was, could be placed in a situation where he bridged the gaps between those who had once sat in quiet resilience to the Nazis as Adenauer, who in a letter in 1934 reminded Hermann Goering that he had violated Prussian law to allow Nazi flags to be flown and that he had declared publicly that the NSDAP should be part of the national government in a leading role, had done, whilst also bringing the now former Nazis together to form some of the infrastructure of the new republic, as was with the case with the Galen organization of former SS officers that formed the basis for the modern Bundesnachrichtendienst, the German intelligence service. And to worry over the crimes that Globke was part of, it did not seem to matter. Either the intelligence of the British or the OSS was lacking on Globke's role, or it was chosen to ignore Globke's role in the Holocaust. Or maybe it was easier to dismiss, as it was Goering and principally Frick's, later Himmler's names, that featured on the laws and ordinances. Two of those had bitten the pill, and one had taken a short drop, and were of no worry any more in revealing accomplices and roles that they had played in one of the greatest crimes in human history. Perhaps the Americans knew, and this is how Globke was turned into the spy within the Chancery, who managed to have the office of the Chancellor bugged, ultimately becoming known in the CIA documents by the codename Causa. Whatever the reason for the lack of punishment of Dr. Hans Globke, it remains for me to make one last point or to pose just one last question, and it is to end with where, for myself, this journey began. The beginnings of this podcast series came in the form of one of the many Bundes press conferences held in a building just a short walk from where the trial of Hans Globke was held by the DDR in 1963, and today is situated just over the river Spree from the new Chancery building of Germany. A reporter for RT Deutschland, Florian Warweg, asked a question of the spokesperson of the German government, Martina Fietz, on the 2nd of January 2019. Warweg asks, Why does a portrait still hang in the Chancery building of the known author and main commentator of the Nuremberg race laws? and according to files was also involved in the deportation of 20,000 Jews from northern Greece. Does the German government see the possibility of the removal of the portrait from the Chancery? Martina Fietz replies, Firstly, I cannot confirm that this picture is hanging there. I simply cannot say anything about it, and accordingly I can only offer you that we check it, and if there is anything to say, we will address it then. On the 9th of January, R.T. Deutschland released a letter received from the Chancery that stated, In the administrative area of the Federal Chancery, portraits of all former heads of the Federal Chancery, including Hans Globke, are hung in chronological order. An evaluation of the work or past life of the Chiefs of Office is not connected with this. It was as cold and as matter-of-fact that having lived in Berlin for over six years, I have come to expect of the German government. A portrait still hangs of one of the principal contributors to the race laws of Nazi Germany and the ethnic cleansing of conquered territories is on display in the German Chancery, but we on viewing it should not question the work or past life of the man portrayed. Can you separate the image from the crimes? If a portrait of Hitler as Chancellor was hung, it would be impossible not to separate the man from the crimes committed by his dictatorial regime and government. So how can the portrait of Hans Globke, the man who legally enabled the crimes of the Hitler government, stand divided, maybe because his face is not one we have come to associate with the Third Reich, 
for it was always hidden in the shadow, from the fact of his involvement in the race laws that led to the persecution and ultimately the deaths of millions. Surely there is another option than to have the portrait of a criminal who was tried and found guilty under the Nuremberg Principles, Article 6 of the London Status for International Military Tribunals, Article 5, Paragraph 1 of the Constitution of the DDR, and Subsection 211.47 of the Imperial Criminal Law that was still active in the DDR at the time. It is a portrait that hangs on a wall only a five-minute walk away from the bleak and sombre concrete blocks of the Jewish memorial, a memorial to all of the Jews persecuted by the Third Reich, many of which were persecuted because of Dr. Hans Globke. Or maybe the portrait should hang. It should bring the face of the man who was hidden in the dark for so long to light, but not without context. Hans Globke should not be allowed to be remembered in history only as the longest serving head of the Federal Chancery. He deserves to be remembered for being one of the most vile and horrendous criminals who brought untold misery to millions of people, who Nazi Minister of the Interior Frick had said had proven loyalty and constant readiness for action in carrying out his duties that facilitated and expanded the persecution of those who was subjected to the horrors of the Nazi regime. A man who, even as a devout Catholic, had no regard for the lives of others, be them Jew, Czech, Slovenian, Slovak, Romanian, Lithuanian, Greek, or one of those who wished to expose him and his crimes. He was ever dedicated to his, the Nazi, and later the Adenauer cause. But for the allies who let him go, I leave you with the words of Faust as he spoke to Mephistopheles. He who holds the devil ought to hold him fast, for he will not get chance to catch him a second time. Achtung, Achtung! Here is the Sendestelle Berlin, im Boxhaus, auf Welle 400 Meter. Meine Damen und Herren, this has been Achtung History's He Who Holds the Devil, a production of the Berlin Tour Guide and hosted by Simon J. James. Follow Arctum History on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as Arctum History, or visit the website at www.theberlintourguide.com forward slash Arctum History. If you wish to support the production of Arctum History, you can do so from Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Arctum History. Don't ask, don't.